Welcome back to another edition of Higher Education Today. I'm your host, Stephen Roy Goodman. I'm here in Palmerston North, New Zealand, where we're going to be talking about New Zealand society. And I have with me Mehana Dury, who is uh, the head of the School of Maori Studies at Massey University, and Paul Spoonley, who is a distinguished professor who, if I'm not mistaken, has written 25 books. Welcome to both of you. Hi, Steve. Hi, Steve. Well, maybe if we could start with the traditional Maori Open, if you wouldn't mind. How, how does that work? Tini fitu ki te rangi ko ngauri o rangi tāne ki te whenua ko te ahua tūranga te taumata ko manawa tū te awa ko te kūnanga ki pūrehu roa te whare wānanga i ngari ko rangi tāne e te ui tēnei te uri mihi kawatū kia koe uh, e te kai kōrero tēnā koe tēnā tātou katoa. So really just on behalf of the local iwi, the local tribe, which is rangi tāne, I, I firstly acknowledge uh, our sacred hill, te ahua tūranga, our sacred river, which is the manawa tū river, our people, the Rangitani people, who have been here for a very long time, and also our university, uh, the Māori name is Te Kuninga Kipurehurua, and we welcome you here into our space. Well, thank you very much. And maybe if we could uh, do a little show and tell, we have a map. Would you mind showing us a little mm. bit about where we are in the world? Great. Well, you'll see the two islands uh, in Te Reo Māori, in the Māori language. This is known as Te Ika a Māori, the fish of Māori, or the fish that Māori caught. We're actually located, um, Steve, right here in the heart of the Rangitane area, or the Rangitane region, which is the lower North Island, uh, and surrounded by two really important um, places. The first place is the Ruahine mountain range, and also the Tararua mountain range, and going right through that is the Manawatu River, and the university, of course, is, is right on the banks of the Manawatu River. So we're in the Rangitane region. And how far, while well, you have the map in your hand, how far are we from Los Angeles and San Francisco? <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're probably a, a long, long way as a crow flies, um, but that's a long canoe trip for our old people in, in that speak. <laughs> well, fair enough. Thank you. Uh, well, in terms of, uh, in terms of canoes and, and airplanes, Paul, you must travel quite a bit back and forth to the United States, and I know you have a lot of ties to California. Could you say a word or two about some similarities and differences between the United States and New Zealand societies? Well, let's start with the differences. I mean, one is a very large society that has a world position, uh, and we are not, we're small, we're 4.7 million people, but we're both um, societies that have been built up through migration. Our migration to New Zealand has primarily come from the UK and Ireland, and then in the second half of the 20th century from the Pacific, so we now have the largest Pacific populations anywhere in the world, and then more recently from Asia. So I guess the comparison would be with a, a city like Los Angeles, where you've got all of these migrant groups coming in and providing a melting pot. We too are a melting pot, not quite the same way as the States, but similar in terms of the contribution that migration has made. Well, that's an interesting point about the melting pot, and maybe I could ask both of you if I, if I could. Um, some people say that that's a controversial term, because what it implies is that we're melting some of our history into the majority. Yes. Is, is that a controversial issue here as well? It is, um, because um, Mehana will provide an alternative because you know we each come to this set of issues from quite different positions. And as the indigenous people, as Tangata Whenua, um, there is, I think, a position that Mehana will reflect. So I, I provide advice to government on migration issues. And by the way, we've seen a very significant spike in the number of Americans coming to New Zealand. Um, migration is a topic that can easily attract very emotional contributions, some of which I disagree with quite strongly. Um, at the moment, we're seeing a spike in the numbers coming to New Zealand equivalent to about 1.5% of our population arriving each year. So it's a very, very large inflow. And the question is, what do they contribute? What should we expect of them? So some years ago, I wrote a paper for the cabinet, for the, um, the, the government, the, the ministers in the government, um, on social cohesion. And I thought there should be uh, some things we should expect of migrants, that they should come and respect some of our values, but in return, we should respect theirs. And it's finding that balance, it's finding that sweet spot that I think is the challenge for us as, as countries that see a lot of migrants coming to them. Mm, I, I think this is part of a broader discussion as well in, in the sense that indigeneity is a part of every corner of the globe and certainly within the New Zealand context, 
Uh, when we talk about indigeneity, we're, we're obviously talking about the Māori people as, as tangata whenua or as the people of the land. Uh, there's a number of interesting discussions right now. One of those is with regards to what Paul has, has mentioned, I think the, the influx of, of people from overseas into New Zealand, um, making sure that uh, tangata whenua or, or Māori have continued to have uh, an important place or a distinctive place in the roles that, that we play as caregivers of the land, as stewards of the environment. And so this is a really interesting narrative which is being borne out at the moment in terms of the place of Māori and also the place of iwi, I think, within Aotearoa, within New Zealand. Uh, there's probably something else to add to what Paul's mentioned too, in the sense that we have uh, a large number of Māori communities who are urbanised. Uh, and by that, what I mean is, is that over a period of you know, 30 to 40 to 50 years actually, Māori uh, by and large have moved into urban communities, um, cities like Auckland. And so there's a, an increasing um, need, I think, to have that discussion about the emergence of new tribes. Um, and if you define tribes as having a common ancestor and having a, a common economic resource that they survive or subside from, uh, that's something that we haven't quite um, defined yet, but it's, it's a question that we need to answer, and I think the university is mm. actually in a good place to, to answer that question. Well, do you think that any country in the world has successfully navigated this? Again, it's a good question. <laughs> uh, I, I, I would say that I think New Zealand leads the way in terms of the advancement of indigeneity here in this country. I think um, there wouldn't be any argument around what's happened over the past sort of 30 years in terms of the Māori language, and, and the language is now one of three official languages in New Zealand. Uh, that happened in 1987. Uh, but I also think there's, there's lots of challenges in, in the future, and we need to ensure that whatever we do here, we're able to share our experiences with other Indigenous communities and other Indigenous nations around the world. What you'll probably find is that that's, that narrative, that dialogue is actually occurring at present. But we have an obligation, I think. You know, we've been in an in a advantageous position to be able to rescue the language in some ways and to promote the language and the culture, but certainly we have an obligation to other Indigenous nations as well um, to share those experiences. Can I mm. add something to that? I mean, firstly, we have the benefit of being a small society so that we can do perhaps things that larger societies can't do, but we also have an immigration system which is a very careful pick and choose system. So the migrants coming to New Zealand are better educated, more experienced than the residents. So we have a point system which picks essentially the best migrants that suit our purposes from around the world. So that's a very different tradition though than the, than the US tradition. Yes, yes and, and in fact two thirds of our migrants will be approved because they've got skills that our employers need, which is quite different from the US where the majority of those arriving come under family reunification. So. We, have a, we do have a very different system and, uh, and we then get to, to talk about the sorts of things that Mehana has identified when they get here. And that's a very interesting discussion. It is sometimes quite a fraught discussion. Well, fair enough. In yes. terms of people coming here, so there are mm. a number of study abroad students from the United States who come not only to Massey but also to other universities uh, throughout New Zealand. How do they encounter these issues when they're here? Well, we quite often put them into courses which allow them to understand the society, including Māori language courses, by the way. So there are some introductory Māori language courses, which only a small number do, but a larger number do courses that are about the sociology and the politics and the culture of the society. So they get a bit of a taster of what it means to live and work in New Zealand. And do you think that's enough? No, I don't. No, I, never, never enough, but, um, mm. but, but you know, for Americans who are wanting to experience another society and the cultures that make that up, they get an, a, a sort of taster of that. And if they want to go further and they want to study further, then we'd welcome them back to do possibly graduate studies. But they, the, 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 um, we test them to see whether or not they've enjoyed the experience and the responses are very, very favourable. They love it. And do you have any thoughts to add to that? I think there's a lot to be um, had in terms of gaining an insight into, into the culture of a community and, and indeed the culture of a local iwi or a local tribe. So certainly I think the university is playing a critical role in opening the door um, to not only Americans who, who visit their shores, but I think to others. And, and Massey has this tradition of welcoming in 
people from around the world to, to the university. Um, my sense is that there's a, a growing awareness of the Māori culture across the world. And whilst it's important to promote the language as a language, it's also important to recognise that the culture goes hand in hand with the language. Well, I think for us there's a, a need to ensure that when we promote the language to visitors to Aotearoa, to New Zealand, that we're also giving them the opportunity to embrace the culture and everything that goes with that. Can I just add that um, in our BA uh, we have five compulsory courses. One of those is called Taranga Wai Wai, which translates as the place where you stand. And when the students come for the first time, including the study abroad students, um, they are welcomed by a pōhiri, a, a formal Māori welcome. So it's not like you turn up to your class and your professor says, right, these are the assignments for this uh, semester. We actually have a full cultural welcome, which is in Māori, in the language of Māori, but it um, means doing things like hongi, the touching of the noses, uh, the welcome, rather like the welcome that uh, Mehana extended to you at the beginning, but more, and of singing. So um, um, those American students get a, a taste mm. on that very first day of what it means to study in New Zealand. Well, and speaking of that taste, we're going to take a quick break and we're going to hear from some American students who've studied here in New Zealand and particularly at, uh, at Massey University. We spoke to them a few weeks ago and we're going to hear about their impressions of what you gentlemen are talking about. So we'll be right back with you. Hi, um, I'm Greta Mellinger. I grew up in Lancaster, Pennsylvania and um, I'm going to school at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. I decided to study abroad in New Zealand because I love the great outdoors and it's beautiful here and um, I heard about the New Zealand um, friendly atmosphere, um, so the people, I was really curious um, to experience that. Um, also I was excited about not having a language barrier um, because I wanted to really meet and be integrated into New Zealand life and um, that was really easy for me to do since I'm an English speaking student. I, uh, I have one story that's sort of fun. We were out tramping um, up close to Hawke's Bay area and uh, we went up to a hut, the Macintosh hut, and um, it's a backcountry hut so it's not an alpine hut so just very small. And there was a possum hunter that showed up and <laughs> he brought in an entire leg of veal. <laughs> and um, we had a really nice evening together. We had veal for dinner and we played cards. And um, yeah, it was, a really, it was a really fun experience, sort of realizing uh, it was something that you would never be able to do in the US. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name's Logan March, and I'm from the U.S. originally. So I'm from, actually, the University of Pittsburgh. So I actually, I grew up in New Jersey. I was born in New Jersey, grew up in New Jersey, and um, it was about, you know, a 30-minute drive to New York City, but also, it was a 30-minute drive to everywhere, including the beach and stuff like that, so it was a really fun time. So I, uh, I heard an accent in a movie, and it turns out it was the Maori accent. And I, like, as a kid, I just I fell in love with that accent. So I always had it with me my entire life. And I was like, I really want to know what that's like. Uh, so my father, he said, Logan, you should study abroad. So I said, yeah, why not? And I decided to go to the country that had the accent that I really wanted to get to know better. And so I decided to come to New Zealand. And Massey University was a bit of a random choice for me, actually. But it turns out it was a great choice for me. So the university in the US, um, I, th I feel like they focus more on the assignments they give you. Um, but here I feel they focus more on the content. They, they give you less assignments, um, which means they're weighted more. But I think that's a, it's better for me because I feel like it's more focused on the content that's in the assignments and not the assignments themselves and the grades of each assignment. So one morning I looked into it and I selected you know, any program that would go to New Zealand. And I found the teen program, and through them, they just really helped me to go to New Zealand. Uh, as far as the discussing it with my parents, like the distance, uh, they, they were always a bit sad about how far it was. 
But for me, it was really never a problem because, you know, Pittsburgh, the University of Pittsburgh that I go to is a little bit far from home anyway, so it's really not too much of a difference if you think about it. I don't really just get to go home a lot, so. I'm really thankful for the friend group that I've made here. Um, it's the Alpine Club. They're um, mostly the, the members that run it. Um, they have all their own flat, and um, me and some American girls, my friends, we will all go over and like help make dinner. Every Wednesday night, we'll usually make a dinner together, and then during the weekends, we'll usually try to make food again or hang out, have a movie night, something like that. So that's been great. And then um, a memorable moment was definitely Rob Roy Glacier in the South Island. I cried my butt off. It was just unreal, natural beauty that I've never seen before. And so that was a really great, great thing to, to experience and, and be a part of, be in, live in. People, when they say you study abroad, they say you're going to have a great time, but you're going to have moments where you're going to be sad and you're going to go through like really rough periods. And I've, I've had a few, but far in between. It's been mostly, you know, I'm, I'm sad to leave, honestly. I'm sad that my journey is coming to a close. Welcome back. We're continuing our discussion about New Zealand society. And we just heard from some American study abroad students who have been here at Massey University. And what they almost all said was that they had a very profound experience. Do you think that that's unusual that they would have had this profound experience? Well, I think there's something about the isolation geographically of, of New Zealand, the Baltiaro, which um, makes things quite special for people who haven't been here before. Um, certainly, I think the, uh, the elements of Māori culture that are uh, most distinctive are quite obvious in, in society across Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, wherever you go, you'll usually hear Māori words being used, whether it's through place names or references on television and on the news and those sorts of things. So um, that's a great thing. I think it adds to the sense of experience that people have when they come to these shores. Um, the constant battle for, for Māori, for all tribes, all iwi, is to ensure that the place of the language is firmly implanted in, in the, um, the principles of this country. And that's always a challenge to make sure that we can promote the language as a, as a living, breathing language, which is really also indicative of the, the strength of the culture as well. But that's an interesting point, um, if I may, because a lot of students who are studying are coming here precisely because this is an English-speaking country. <laughs> <laughs> to an extent, although, um, as Paul will say too, I think you know, we have three official languages in the country. and. Um, Sign language is the other one, of course, te reo Māori and, and English, but um, there's something about um, travelling to a country when you immerse yourself in the indigenous language and culture, I think it adds to the richness of mm. the, the experience. And I'd certainly promote and encourage um, all students who come to New Zealand to, to have that experience. And I think certainly um, people go home richer for that experience as well. I would like to add too that um, Probably some of the things that they're going to encounter as study abroad students here will be very familiar to them if they've come out of a US university system. So I hope that we can give them some out of class experiences which will add to their enjoyment uh, while they're here in New Zealand. Such as the outdoors, do you mean? The outdoors, bungee jumping, um, perhaps um, some of our more extreme um, uh, experiences mm. in, in, the, in the wilderness would be good. but. Um, Possibly parents in the US might not want to hear about that. But we, 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 we do a lot of things slightly differently in New Zealand, and uh, we do encourage people to, to get out there and uh, experience. If you wouldn't mind saying a word or two about those things you do, do diff differently, do you do bungee jumping yourself? No, I don't. Um, <laughs> I'm too old for that, Steve. Uh, but, but I certainly do a number of things like um, cycling, kayaking, you know, those um, outdoor experiences, camping. Uh, we do that all the time, and we try and bring some of the... We, we host international students in, a, in my home, so we'll always take those students with us, and, you know, getting catching your own dinner, typically fish, or um, mussels, um, harvesting mussels at the sea and cooking them. I mean, that's, that's a rather different experience. Mm. I mean, I'd add to that by saying, I, I think... There's a there's saying here in New Zealand that to, to see the country you have to get off the beaten track and certainly that's true in this country that when you uh, take a, a different route across the country and you head out to all of these rural areas and these small communities around the country, I think you get a much better understanding about the psyche of this place and in terms of that, that dependence on the land which you don't necessarily see in the bigger cities. Um, Manawatu, Palmerston North uh, still has that feeling to it, and it's not hard to get off the beaten track here. You can go up into the ranges there or to the Manawatu River, and, and it gives, 
I think a much um, closer, uh, people a much closer idea of the way that we live with the land and the relationship we have mm. to the land as well, certainly from an iwi perspective. Um, my understanding is there was a founding treaty here, yes. is that depending on who you ask, it was either a great treaty or not such a great treaty. Yes. Did I understand that correctly? Yes, you did, Mayhana. Yeah. Uh, well, let me, let me just <laughs> talk very briefly on that. It's, it's an incredibly important document for this nation, for Aotearoa New Zealand. Important for a number of reasons, but really to, to talk about the intent, I think, of the treaty as it stands now. It's about having this bicultural partnership between Māori as the tangata whenua, or as the custodians of the lands, and Pākehā, who, who settled here in New Zealand in the 1800s. So that's a very, very important um, distinction around this country is the, um, the commitment to a bicultural partnership. And so when we talk about the treaty, it applies to education, it applies to health, it applies to all sorts of areas. But um, in the back of uh, the minds of all New Zealanders, I think, is this need to ensure that we somehow give expression or embody uh, the principles of the treaty as it stands. So, you know, for me, it's about bicultural partnership, sharing um, elements of our journeys, our experiences, and being richer for that. It was signed in 1840. It was very unusual. I mean, this is a country that was colonised by the British. The British didn't do this very often, so it was an interesting treaty between the chiefs of the iwi, or the tribes of New Zealand, and the representative of the um, British Queen, the UK Queen. Um, and we describe ourselves as a university as being treaty-led. So we need to give expression to that, the importance of that treaty. There are some people who see a treaty as outdated, but we all have these treaties. I mean, um, Declaration in the US or the Magna Carta in the, in the UK. We need to keep talking about them and how they apply in a modern context. But for us, and for me in particular, and for uh, people like Mahana, it is our founding document. And both of you keep mentioning the land, per se. Mm. So it's an interesting concept because you're speaking about the land as if the land is almost sacred, if I'm hearing you correctly. From a, a Māori cultural perspective, we trace our genealogy back to the land. And it's an interesting um, element of our culture and a distinctive element of our culture too. So uh, we're able to recite the names of our ancestors and recite our names back to the land, to Papa Tuanuku uh, as the Earth Mother and Te Ranginui as a Sky Father. So that's really a reflection of the relationship that we have with the land. And, and I guess our view is that we're we're here as custodians of the land. So when we talk about environmental issues in New Zealand, uh, we talk about that with a lot of passion. And, and that's because we have this um, very, very strong bond and connection which we trace through our ancestors back to the land. Um, the other thing I'd say is that the, the degradation of the land, for example, a river uh, may be polluted or a, a piece of land may be polluted. From a Māori world view, that would be uh, um, a sense that the vitality of the land has been transgressed and therefore it affects the health or the well-being of the people. So we're in this constant um, narrative, this discussion about how we need to ensure we look after the land because by looking after the land, we're also actually looking after our own vitality, whether it's spiritually or physically as well. And, and we, I, so I would describe myself as Pākehā, which is a... Um, my parents were from the UK, uh, so they were migrants themselves, but I grew up here, I sound like a New Zealander, my values are those of New Zealand. So as a member of the majority group, I would describe myself as Pākehā, and then we pick up that notion of guardianship, or kaitiakiatanga, um, as a way of we need to look after the land. We've got a lot of it in, in New Zealand, we're, not, we're very pa sparsely populated, and, and so land becomes something that is very important to us, it defines us as New Zealanders, and that doesn't matter whether you're Māori or Pākehā. Mm. Yeah, but what do you do if somebody comes who doesn't respect the land? Um, well, we have, uh, we have policies, and we have courts, and we have various um, bodies that look after the land, but I think we're not talking about that. I think we're talking about the way in which we as individuals reflect that. So if we see somebody who is desecrating land or polluting um, a river, in the case of, that Mahan has mentioned, um, we then have a, a responsibility as citizens to do something about that. I, I think it's a, we, we keep talking about partnership in this country, you've heard about bicultural partnership, 
between Māori and Pākehā, I think that notion of partnership also extends to things like the environment. And one of the things we did, uh, very unfortunately, was we introduced um, animals from overseas which have now become pests. So one of our major national projects is to actually reduce or perhaps eliminate those pests from New Zealand, possums from Australia, rats, you know, so pests that do a lot of damage to our countryside and to our bird life. So, mm. I mean, I'm involved personally outside of my academic role in trying to preserve the environment through um, various organisations, and I do trapping uh, these pests as part of that. It's a very important role that you pull, mm. because I think part of that conversation is the fact that within the Māori culture and within different tribal co- tribal narratives as well, um, certain native flora and fauna, uh, birds, mm. um, well, wildlife, have certain roles uh, in terms of the tribe, and, and certain um, symbolic references are, are part of that discussion too. So. Um, the work that Paul and others are doing to, to promote you know, a greater awareness of the risks to the environment is certainly, from our view, um, critical because those are such entrenched elements of our narrative culture that if we, if we lose a certain species of bird, for example, mm-hmm. we lose that connection and, and therefore that discussion becomes a lot more important when you put it in that broader context. And just, I guess, one more thing before we leave. If, I, if we can take that map one more time, Paul, and maybe this time you could show where the major cities are uh, for uh, an American viewer? Our major cities are in the South Island, Christchurch and Dunedin. Those are the two major cities. In the North Island, our capital is in Wellington. Uh, we have a, a, a large city here, Hamilton, and one on the coast called Tauranga. But almost 40% of New Zealanders live in Auckland or near Auckland. And Auckland last year was described as the fourth most diverse city in the world, just behind Toronto. So that's the destination for a lot of our visitors and a lot of our immigrants who are coming to New Zealand. Well, thank you both very much. If you would like additional information about our two distinguished visitors or about Massey University, please visit massey.ac.nz. If you would like to send a message to our viewer mailbox, please do so at highereducationtoday at topcolleges.com. And thank you for watching. We will continue to bring you quality discussions about important matters in today's college and university world. I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, and you've been watching Higher Education Today. (laughs) 